Welcome to the Runner Podcast. I'm Coach Anya, an international marathon runner. And I'm Coach Ben, and one of the co-founders of Runner. Each week we'll be deep diving into the world of running, speaking to some inspiring individuals about their running journeys. Runner is the number one rated running coaching service worldwide. We help hundreds of thousands of people all over the world train for any running goal. And if you want to try out Runner for free, you can try it out using the code RUNNERPODCAST, all one word, to get two weeks of free access to the Runner app. On today's episode, we have my personal physio and joining the coaching team at Runner, Adrian DaCosta. He's the founder of The Running Room, a running-focused physio, s and coach, and expert in running injuries. So Adrian, great to have you on. I guess we'd love to start with what is it about fitness, running, and helping people that got you to kind of progress to being a physio in the first place? For sure. Um, thanks for having me, firstly. Um, for me, the, there was always an element of helping people so inherently i think one of my skill sets and things that i enjoy doing is to help so whether it's if it's not physio it's helping my mates figure out a solution with something it's going over and helping a friend out so i think that inherent trait of being a helper propelled me into what i do now with physio because we're constantly dealing with people coming in with a series of issues and problems um and obviously trying to help them to get to a race whether it's a marathon a 5k so i i, I really enjoyed that and i really like problem solving as well alongside that so Problem solving with respect to movement is, is really fun. It's exciting. You know, some people might not think it's that much fun dealing with a stress fracture, but for me, love seeing a stress fracture and trying to figure out how we get that person from where they are to where they want to be. So I think it's a combination of those two things together that sort of got me to find running. I was never a runner growing up. I never really ran much, you know, probably did an occasional 5K here and there. But I think once I got into physio, I was quite fortunate to work in a clinic back in Sydney that focused on treating a lot of runners and just started to enjoy working with the population it was a good group of people to work with runners are really good with their rehab so that made it fun because they listened to what we told them to do because they wanted to get back to running so I think when you've got a really nice compliant population group you sort of fall in love with it more you start to see some great results and and then the community is just amazing I think for me the community element of like being able to go somewhere meet people that you know grab a coffee grab some pizza or a beer afterwards I think there's a certain power of belonging that you just can't replace. So I think all those factors together, sort of running found me as much as I found running. Um, and that's what brings me here today. I guess. So I guess working alongside runners, has it encouraged you to run more yourself? Like are you? 100%. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think I would probably say it wasn't, I, I prefer team sports and I, I would still say I prefer playing team sports because I'm competitive. Um, but I now would run two to three times a week. Um, more so for my own headspace. For me, running is headspace. It gives me an opportunity to gather my thoughts, think about how my business is doing, think about how life is, am I doing things the right way, reflect on my week, plan, forecast. Um, so for me, that's where my running journey is right now. So yeah, I you know if I'm not running regularly, then I find myself in a position where I'm foggy. I'm not really clear with my thoughts. I'm probably scrambling through my week. Probably not sleeping well because I'm not burning enough energy. So I'm waking up tired and lethargic. So I think there's a fundamental place where running is like a bedrock of what I do and one of those foundational pillars of my week. And obviously you're my physio too. Um, what is the importance of strength and conditioning and why should we all in start to include it in our training? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the way you look at it is um, look at it like a car, right? I think the analogy of a car is a really good way to understand running better and, and really simplify a very complex process without boring you in the details of physiology and what it all means. But running is your is your is your distance. It's your motor. So you know whether it's running from here to East London, it's whether it's running from the north of England to the south of England, and things like that. But running is what drains and takes away fuel from your body, and SNC is part of what contributes putting fuel into your body. It's part of your fueling system. So you have good fundamental things like hydration, making sure you're eating well. Those are your bedrock sort of like fueling elements. But then what lives alongside it, which gets forgotten about is S and C. So as you're getting stronger, as you're getting so stronger as a runner, faster as a runner, your cardiovascular fitness is improving, but you're not fueling your body well enough. You're not building a, a strong enough car. So you've got this car, which has an amazing motor. It's like taking an engine of a Ferrari and putting it into a Fiat. You can't fit a V12 into a Fiat, right? So you need to build the chassis. Yeah. You need to get your muscles strong enough. You need to make sure that 
your joints are resilient enough to tolerate the workload of being able to go from, you know, say for example, you're a perfect example where you first started doing a marathon at four plus hours or closer to five hours, yeah. correct me on the, on the times, but now to the point where you're at the brink of 2.30 and, and pushing those crazy times, like you need to be able to, to make sure your body is resilient enough to tolerate that intensity of workload. And that's where strength and conditioning is so important. It allows you to build more capacity. It allows you to push your body and take it to a level where you wouldn't be able to do it just purely in running alone. Yeah. I mean, I always think of running as this kind of crazy sport where we're basically just hopping. Doing a marathon might be hopping up and down, all one leg after the other for three or four hours. And well, like, it's essentially what it is. Yeah. And that's a very unusual thing to do yeah. if you're not used to running. So that's where we need to build the strength in our core and all of our between single legs, etc., to to be able to tolerate that, right? Hundred percent. Like when you think about a marathon, which is what everyone's fascinated with at the moment, in a marathon, the average runner will do fifty thousand steps, which essentially is fifty thousand single leg hops, twenty five thousand on each side. So the cumulative stress and magnitude of force that that person is going to be putting through their body is it's a lot, you know, to to say it nicely. Um, so. If you then look at that and then you go, well, what are you doing in order to make sure you can tolerate that sort of force? Then, you know, it, and if it's not loading it up with S and C, and if it's not doing the right things around sort of your load management and the right running programming and, and plan, then you're going to get yourself in trouble. And we're seeing that a lot now as well. Like, there's more people running marathons, but with that, there's also a bigger spike of percentage of runners getting injured. Uh, we see it in clinic as well with the types of injuries we're seeing. We're seeing a lot more injuries that we traditionally wouldn't have seen as much of, but you know, high incidence rates, stress fractures being a great example. And so I guess for runners, what would you say are the most common injuries and things to be aware to look out for? For sure. Uh, the most common running related injury is, is runner's knee. So an, an, an injury so common within runners, they just gave it the, its own name. So it, the technical term is patellofemoral pain. So it's pain around your kneecap or behind your kneecap. But the common term is known as runner's knee because it's widely seen within runners. And what, and what is runner's knee? What, what, what brings it on? And, and what would one do? What would what maybe one feel with runner's knee? And then how would one look to treat or avoid it? For sure. So the, the main reason as to why it happens and the main reason as to why probably 90% of running related injuries take place is load management. Bringing in running too fast, too soon. Uh, and too much as well. So spikes in volume, spikes in intensity, and probably doing them coupled together. So like going out for a long run and deciding, hey, I normally do my long run at six minutes per kilometer. Today, I'm just going to choose to do it at five minutes per kilometer. You know, that's not only a volume, but it's also an intensity challenge. So you do that, you start to spike the interaction between the forces. So every time you go into, and this is going to be a little bit technical, but every time you make contact with the ground, your knee and especially that quadricep muscle is primarily designed and its role is to absorb force. Everything in the back, like your hamstrings, your glutes, are generating propulsion force. So if you're going to then do a lot more volume and a lot lot faster runs, that quadricep now has to work 10 times harder. The kneecap is the pulley that connects the quadricep to the bone. So then all of a sudden that interaction, that, that joint is starting to then take way more force. It's getting spiked. And everything in your body has an adaptation rate. So muscles will adapt quickly, beautiful blood supply, great adaptation rates. Tendons, no blood supply, takes longer. Bones, longer still because of the, the type of tissue it is. So when you're dealing with bones and joints, you know, we're looking at, we're looking at spikes in load across two to three months preceding the actual incidence of the injury. And then that's where things will start to manifest. People start to get, you know... Um, pain around the kneecap it feels like a nice deep seated achy pain and then you start to do something a little bit sharper and faster then it will start to stab you into the knee a little bit so it feels like a sharp stabby pain depending on the the spikes and load and so i guess kind of like with that in mind you're saying what's bringing it on is increasing your volume increasing yeah. your intensity too too much and too fast For sure so that's one of the things that we can do to reduce the likelihood of, of it yeah. coming around in the first place 100 i guess without putting the words in your mouth like i guess we could be strengthening our quads what other things could yeah. we be doing to avoided in the first place yeah so i mean runners are notoriously really poor at doing snc work i think it's improving it's a lot better where we are in 2024 than where we were say 2019 um but you know lack of strength in your quads means your quads are not strong enough to absorb force so you can definitely get stronger through your quad complex similarly hamstrings is another one so when you make contact with the ground your hamstrings have to decelerate so getting your hamstrings stronger means that balance between your quads and hamstrings ratio is in a better place um, and then working above and below the chain. So your knee's like a middle child. It's highly influenced by the hip, highly influenced by the knee. 
So if your hip stability is not good enough, your knee is going to then go all over the place. It might, you know, might cave in a bit. That's going to change the forces going through the kneecap. So you can do a lot to build stability around the hips. Similarly with the ankle, if your ankle's wobbly, if you've had previous injuries like ankle sprains, then your ankle, your ankle stability is going to be compromised. So you could do a lot to build strength around the ankle, build stability and the ankle. So there's no sort of like one specific exercise. I think a general good overall loading plan is going to be highly beneficial. But I think the key focus area is going to have to be around muscles up, attach around the knee just to take pressure off the actual joint. And I guess something that is very well cited that one should do is stretch and do some mobility. Yep. How would you say that ties into running injuries generally and then also runner's knee? For sure. Mobility is a good one. So I'll start with mobility because I think mobility is referring to how much range of motion a joint has. And I think this is varied for a lot of people. So we always look at, say for example, you come in Ben and you've got runner's knee and your right knee. So I'll have a look at your left knee and go, how well does your left knee move? And if you've got more range of motion in your left knee, then I know, okay, that's probably what we need to work towards because the injury is causing a reduction in range of motion. It's reducing your mobility. So you have to work harder in in less range. Um, But then I might get someone who's got poor mobility across the board so you know am i going to be able to get mobility from that person maybe maybe not it just depends on what their background and their training is so i'd say mobility is important but in the context of that individual runner i wouldn't say there's like an arbitrary amount you need to hit but definitely making sure it's symmetrical side to side flexibility and stretching is uh you know we could probably talk hours on this but I would say for the large component, most runners don't struggle with flexibility as much and running doesn't dictate an ultra amount of flexibility. Yeah. When you make contact with the ground, you do need to generate good stiffness in the limbs, so tendons, muscles need to engage and contract. And if you want to work on flexibility with respect to stretching, you've got to dedicate time, which not many people do. So I think when we look at like when what, what most people do, and I'm, I'm sort of guilty of this as well, I'll finish a run, I, go, I feel a bit tight, so I must stretch my quad. I'll hold it for like 45 seconds to a minute. What the research will show us in order to actually get flexibility changed through stretching, you've got to stretch that muscle from anywhere from like two to eight minutes. That's per muscle group. So like that's two to eight minutes per quad, per glute, per hamstring. You tally all that up, it's like 60 minutes worth of like mobility work. No one's doing that. So I think if you if you want to like get the most bang for buck from like a mobility flexibility perspective, you're better off doing things where obviously strength work is going to mean you have more capacity. There's types of strength training like what we call eccentric training, where you're actually lengthening at the muscle, so you're getting not only strength but you're getting flexibility there as well. And research will show us that when you do eccentric based training, the carrier of flexibility even after you finish training is far greater than what you get with stretching alone. So they've done studies where they've looked at people seizing stretching and eccentric training and even 12 to 24 months so 12 to 24 weeks afterwards they maintain the, the flexibility change in the eccentric group but not in the stretching group and so for those listening what is eccentric yeah so eccentric training is when you're contracting a muscle but the muscle fibers are lengthening out so for example great most common example to give someone is when you're doing a heel raise that lowering phase as you're going down below the level of a step if you're doing a heel raise on a step and you can feel your calves engaging that's an eccentric contraction to a certain point until you start to like get sloppy with your technique so it's essentially like suggesting to achieve that range of motion or to stretch your muscles while strengthening at the same time yeah and doing mm-hmm. the same example would be your bicep curl to do the eccentric the is when you make phase. it longer yeah, um, yeah. So and no. typically would work as you're sort of like going against gravity so if you're doing like a romanian deadlift it's that lowering phase um and you get a two for one like it's like a buy one get one free like who doesn't like a good deal right like yeah, you so get you're getting some... stronger and you're getting your flexibility yeah but if you're just stretching for like a minute or two, like, and, and this is probably a controversial opinion, but I say it, I say it loudly and proudly and I wear it on my, on my chest is that I think for the most part, stretching is overrated, especially when most runners are engaging in stretching, like they're not doing it for long enough. Yeah. And so if we could do one thing, it would be to do good strength and conditioning work yeah. with good full range of motion yeah. to support the running. 100%. If you're doing stretching for a minute or two minutes, you're just changing perceptions around soreness in your central nervous system, which is no different to foam rolling, which is no different to massage gunning. So you can do any one of those three things that will do exactly the same thing for you. Okay, so interesting. Yeah. So runners always go through injury and we know how frustrating that is. What advice would you give someone, yeah, going through it and the rehab and trying to get back to running? So someone is actually Injured. in sort of the injury zone itself. Yeah. 
For sure. I think first thing is like seek help, like make sure that you know exactly what your injury is and what you can tolerate. I think we fu- we get into this sort of thing of like going to social media sometimes and going, oh, this person has shin splints. So do I. I'll just follow what they do. But no two people are the same. So you want to make sure that you have a plan that is targeted towards what you can do, understanding your capacity or your, um, your strength points in terms of what you can manage. Um, but fundamental things like top two things to be mindful of is don't rush back into running. And if when you do go back into running, bring in volume first. Don't bring in pace. People get excited and want to go out for their fast run straight away. And that's going to be too much overload into the body. And then the second thing is just have a good graded strength plan, something that progressively gets harder week in, week out uh, with some good sort of like deload weeks in there. So it just allows your body to play a bit of catch up as well. And I guess we've spoken about runner's knee some of the other common running injuries that I'd love to kind of like shed a little bit more light on would probably be that of shin splints and then would love to come on to maybe IT band syndrome. I guess those are two really common ones. I guess to start with shin splints, what would someone feel if they are um, experiencing some shin splint type symptoms? Sure. On, on the milder end, if you're just starting to experience some shin splint symptoms, it feels like a a deep ache that sort of lives on the inside component of your your shin bone or your tibia bone, so the inside part of the calf. And that can be up by the knee and up, up down by the ankle? Pretty much could go as high as the, the knee, maybe an inch below the knee, and as low as sort of like an inch above the sort of like bony bump on the inside of your ankle. So you could have a, a broad spectrum there in terms of where it would manifest. And initially, if someone's got a low-grade shin splint, so shin, the the... The medical term for shin splints is medial tibial stress syndrome. So essentially what shin splints is, it's a stress response of your bone. So it's the early signs or the early formations of what could manifest into a stress fracture if not managed appropriately. So I think that's important for people to know because people just wave off shin splints like it's nothing crazy, but actually needs a lot more delicate management. So initially when you're experiencing it, it feels a bit more widespread. There's a relatively large area of pain across the shin Pain is probably more like in low sort of like deep achy feel um, as opposed to something sharp. Um, And you could probably run through it. So you might feel it at the start of your run where things are tight, the calf is tight. You warm up, you get going, has a nice little bit of a warm up effect and then you can get through your run and it might bother you maybe later in the evening once you cool down or next morning as you get out of bed, you feel like, okay, cool, it's feeling a little bit achy. So that's your early signs. If you're someone, which ends up happening a lot, unfortunately, if you're someone who goes, oh, you know what, I'm just going to put up with this. And then you keep running, you keep doing your training. You don't really back off in any which way. That deep A can start to get a little bit sharp, can start to stab you a little bit, can reach a point where it gets worse through the course of your run. You try and do something faster. You just almost feel like you want to hobble off and hop, hop off the leg. You don't want to put weight onto it. And it can really reach a point where you're limping, like even walking itself can be painful. So the act of just walking across the road, stepping off a curb, things like that can give, just give you shocks and sort of vibrations into that sort of like shin area as well. So I guess we want to treat it early and rather than running through it, like we're saying, relatively reduce our volume, reduce our intensity as yep. early as possible when we start to feel these more general aches, Yep. take it easy for a little bit and then gradually build back up. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, as a general rule, bang on. I think when dealing with shin splints, understanding what kind of movements are going to benefit you. So when we're dealing with a bone-based injury and, and, and a nice big bone like your tibia or your shin bone, what it responds really well to is what we call like an axial loading sort of movement. So that's like this beautiful top to bottom compressive load. And what that does is it just allows the bone to adapt and like turn over positively to get stronger. So essentially we're trying to restore some of that bone mineral density in those local sites around the bone. So things that are beneficial for that are like some good loaded squat movements, RDLs, leg press, split squats, all your big compound movements do really well in the, in this, in the situation. So, and also dub, double leg, cause you want to get a good amount of intensity in there. I think sometimes runners go straight to the single leg work. But the single leg work, from my experience, unless you load it up really heavy, which is extremely hard to do, when you're doing single leg work, you're largely working on stability and not strength, which is needed. But if the rationale is to get stronger and is to get more load into the bone, then you're going to get a better effect and a more potent effect from doing double leg work. So I think really knowing why an exercise needs to be in your program rather than just you know doing the generic single leg squats and single leg RDLs, which... I'm not really making you stronger, it's more stability focused. 
And should we be focusing on our whole leg? Should we be thinking about more about the calves? Um, what's your advice there? Um, calf strength for sure, because part of the issue is around sort of the calf muscle attaching onto the shin bone and tugging and pulling on the exterior sort of film that lives around the shin bone. So getting your calf stronger, making sure it's resilient enough to absorb force and then give you force propulsion on the way out. So, you know, you, as a general rule, you cannot go wrong as a runner getting your calf strong. It's a muscle that works harder than any other muscle in your body. So when you're running fast or you, you know, you're pushing some paces, your calf's working almost nine, eight to nine times its body weight in force. The muscle that comes in at a not so close second is your lateral hip at 1.3 to 2, two times body weight in force. All these big muscles are still working, but because they're massive muscles and running is not a big sort of like magnitude spike kind of loads. It's not like you're doing long jump and you need to hit the ground really hard or dunking a basketball where you have to really generate a lot of force in like one moment. Running is that continual sort of like low amplitude movement. Things like quads, hamstrings, they're, they're working at like 0. 0.5, 0. 0.7 times its body weight in force. They're still working, but not like the calf. So if, you, if there's one movement you, every runner should do, it one, one strength exercise should be a calf raise. Amazing. Yeah. I do calf raises while brushing my teeth. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can I, you know, can't go wrong. I, I would say, you know, just try and factor it into your day. Try and get the loading right, especially as you're trying to run faster. Like the body weight stuff, like anything, will, will lose its effect. So you need to start working maybe on a step. You need to start adding additional weight, things of that nature. Yeah. I guess the, the other one that I mentioned was IT band syndrome. Yeah. Um, so this is where people get the pain down the outside of their thigh. Yeah. Um, and it's this, this pain where that inserts into the knee as well. Um, talk us through IT band syndrome yeah. and what one can do maybe to avoid it developing and then how one would um, treat it as well. For sure. Um, I mean, we've already spoken about load management. That's yeah. universal across all running related injuries. I think when we're dealing with IT band issues and load management, we're really looking at what sort of terrains people are running on. So if you are local to, say, the beautiful southwest London like we are, Battersea Park is a home for running for us, which is beautifully cambered. So unless you run down the middle of Battersea Park or like if you've got a cambered pathway and it's sloping away, it's going to start to impact and influence how you choose to run on that terrain and might start to cause a bit of lengthening out elements where you're your knee, your leg is caving in to find a happier midpoint. So that means your your lateral chain is getting lengthened out more. You're putting more strain through your ITB. So I think know your terrains. So if you've got cambered surfaces, try and stay in the middle, try and avoid that. And the other thing is also trying to avoid too much downhill running as well. Because when you're going downhill, that leg once again is having to stretch and find the ground again. So that's going to be an element where you can avoid it if you feel like you're developing some IT band pain. Um, in terms of sort of like the IT band itself, like, it's a big piece of fibrous tissue. Imagine a spider web and then 50 spider webs all compressed into a really, really thin, like nice thick piece of fibrous tissue, tissue that attaches from your hip to the side of the knee. And it's there to kind of give a bit of tension and, and, and obviously to pack in all the structures underneath it as well. So it's not going anywhere. It's not going to stretch. So and inherently people always go, oh, I'm going to stretch my IT band to make it feel better. It's not going to stretch. Like you would need to have like two cars going five miles five miles in opposite directions in order to get some sort of stretch in it and so instead should we target the glutes or how do we yeah so you can get a bit of strength through the glutes for sure because your your attachment point in the top is going to be your glutes um you can work a lot on the underlying muscles because sometimes there can be a few adhesions that sort of develop between the it band and the underlying quadricep muscle as well so those are going to be great points to work on um, and then also looking at running gait as well. So if someone's got overstride, if someone's got what we call like a crossover gait, so where the legs are almost crossing over and it looks like they're running on a tightrope, that's going to put a lot of strain on that sort of like hip area, which is then going to have a carryover onto your onto your IT band as well. So those are things to to correct on as well. Amazing, that's nice. really helpful. Um, so we have spoken about running off an injury isn't really a thing we should be doing. Are there any other misconceptions or myths we can uh, solve? Like I was thinking about, are carbon plated shoes really causing us more injuries now? Yeah, um, I think so. <laughs> and I say I think so because the, the research still probably hasn't caught up based on like the the time the carbon plated shoes have been around and. But I think from what we're seeing, at least in clinic, definitely we're seeing a lot of Achilles based injuries. Um, where people are going straight into carbon-plated shoes. And it's a combination of 
people going into carbon plated shoes and running really fast because they feel great and they feel light. So naturally, you're just going to increase forces going through your body. Uh, but then sometimes we're also seeing people wearing carbon plated shoes because they look cool. And like we're in this sort of like aesthetic age of running where like it's as much as about how you look as about how you perform. Uh, so you, we see people going for like easy runs, like 5.30 to 6 minute pace runs in a pair of alpha flies. You have no business being in the pair of shoes like that, doing an easy run. And if you're going to be taking, you know, uh, slower pace, lower cadence, that force has to then modulate and, and sort of like attenuate through your body in some way. And that's going to come in, you know, at the point of the Achilles because you're going to overstride. You're not going to be getting your body to be nice and stiff and compressed to, you know, appreciate the landing and what that carbon plate shoe would need. So I'd say as a general rule, yes, but jury's still out in terms of like the actual sort of amount of risk it brings in and how should one think about integrating carbon shoes into their running routine um with all of that in mind great question i I, firstly i don't think there's like a perfect way of doing it but i would say know know that carbon plated shoes are designed for like the way you when you look at it and when you talk to shoe manufacturers you know some people will say that you should only wear carbon plated shoes if you're running under 430 minute kilometers Okay. which I think is the equivalent to about a 720-minute yeah. mile. So correct me if I might be off here and there. But um, So, you know, if you're running five minutes or slower, then maybe you have no business being there. Just get naturally better at your cardiovascular fitness. But then when you do bring it in, really pick the runs in the week where you actually need that utility from. And that might be running on track or doing like a tempo run, so your session runs in the week. So that would mean a maximum amount of, two sessions in a week where you'd wear a carbon plated shoe but you could almost argue and say you don't always need that if you've got a nice light pair of shoes or a lot of brands are doing like half nylon plates like your like your Saucony's, um then you can also do some of your sessions which are not as intense like if you just got a, a nice steady tempo run as opposed to say a progressive run then you can do that and in in a shoe like that and then just keep your carbons for one one run in the week and, and i guess one thing that you said to start with is that some of the reasons why people are getting in these injuries, the Achilles injuries, for example, is that they're kind of buying these carbon shoes, going out and doing their big long run and smashing it super, super fast. And I guess one of the things that I've always been aware of as to reduce risk of injuries, would love to hear like your thoughts on this, is just presumably everything's about gradually introducing new load into our bodies. Like if we're going to start running in these new shoes, presumably we should run with them, test them out, gradually run in them more over time, rather than go from zero to 100. And that's the same doing with all of the injuries we've already spoken about during the, the runner's knee, we need to not go from zero to 100 and overstress the quads and, and the integrations of the knee. Um, is that kind of like the, 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 the advice there to gradually introduce these new, new loads? Sure. I think, you know, gradual introduction is always going to be the safest and most effective way. So if you are going to do a, a, a tempo run, maybe that might be a tempo run where the intensity is high, but the volume is low. So the overall load is a bit more managed as opposed to just going out for a fast, long run where everything is spiked up. So there's definitely a lot to be said in, in doing that for sure, 100%. Amazing. I guess kind of a last question talking about all of these injury type things before we come on to our slightly sillier uh, second half of the podcast. would love to, to know what one piece of advice could you give someone starting out on their running journey um, with a view of avoiding getting injured and having a strong, healthy, happy life as a runner? For sure. Um, be disciplined. Like, no, listen to your body and be disciplined. I think... We can sometimes get guilty about trying to take on someone else's running journey, which is not our own journey. I think being in the day and age, which is social media, and you see someone else doing something, you feel like you want to do exactly what they're doing. Know your journey, know how long you've been doing something for, and also know that if you want to do this for a long time, consistency and discipline of just being nice and gradual with things is always going to mean that you're consistent through the course of your running journey. Otherwise, you'll break down, you'll have periods of break and stoppages, and that's typically where people fall out of love with something as well is because they get injured and they blame the sport for injuring them. Like you'll see it with like running, CrossFit. Oh yeah, I got injured doing CrossFit or running. It's just like, no, it's not the sport that injured you. It's you being silly, introducing the sport into your life. You know, the sport doesn't have a brain of its own. It's, it's you just controlling it. So I think be, be smart, be gradual. Uh, and then yeah, fuel well, you know, good food. Make sure you're eating enough carbs before your runs. Make sure you're hydrating before and after your runs. And yeah, we've spoken about it, S&C work. You know, try and get a couple sessions in in the week. Yeah, so it's almost like focus on the main big structures of our health and fitness yeah. rather than worrying about all these tiny things like a supplement here or a massage gun there. And instead it's like focus on eating well, sleeping well, 
training well and just sticking to these like main main areas and it's only once you've got them right worry about those last tiny bits 100 it, it doesn't exist but like imagine like you know maslow's hierarchy of needs if yeah. you had like a runner's or maslovian runner's hierarchy of needs your base foundation is like good training plan making sure there's no crazy spikes in it um hydration nutrition snc those are the fundamental and sleep yeah those are your fundamental five sort of bedrock everything above it stretching foam rolling massage gun a balm a pit uh, you know, what not. They might help, but they're high hanging fruits where they're only going to give you very, very little sort of benefit. To to the elite runner like Anya, who's running at a, at a point where, you know, she's pushing her body to the limit, those things now start to become more important. But for 95% of us, everyday runners, focus on those. And it's, it's the building runner. blocks. You, you, you build the big blocks first and then you put the little bits on top. 100%. And there's no point Anya worrying about those last 1% if so she's not eating well and not sleeping yeah. well. I mean, we're sitting here on the 11th floor of this building. If they didn't build the first two floors where I wouldn't be here, would be. Yeah, absolutely. Today's tip is to log your running shoe mileage. Old shoes won't offer the same support and cushioning, which can compromise our running style cause us to run slightly differently, which could potentially lead to an injury or niggle. How many miles you get out of a pair of shoes can vary depending on how you run and the type of shoe you're using, but the gold standard is usually between 300 and 500 miles. By logging the number of miles you've done in each pair of trainers, it can make sure you avoid picking up any injuries or niggles and get a new pair before any issues arise. You'll also know by the feel of the shoe and obvious wear and tear if it's time to upgrade. Getting an injury through old and worn shoes is so frustrating. So by logging your trainers, you can track the mileage and make sure you avoid any issues. Always a good excuse to buy a new pair of shoes. We have a fun game of this or that or would you rather for you, which I would love to ask you some questions. Um, number one, okay, would you rather run with crippling doms every time or you're never, ever able to lift weights ever again? Oh, that is a really... Oh, that is mean. So <laughs> run with crippling doms or never be able to lift weights ever again. I would rather run with crippling doms because I love lifting weights. Yeah. So I, I, I'm really torn thinking about that one. Yeah. That's a tough, that's a really good question. I guess they loosen up. Are we, allow, are we allowed to get strong in other ways? Like, could I do body weight strength work and then never have doms when I'm running? Maybe. I think I'm, I think I'm going to get strong through cross training, cycling, body weight work, sport, yeah. and then not have doms every run. Yeah. I just, what well, you, what think? are you picking? I think run with Dons and just hope they like loosen up after a while. So you're doing you're doing you're, you're doing your next you're doing sometimes. you're doing the marathon championships. So you're on the start line of the Olympics <laughs> in four years' time with Dons. Well, you can also yeah. argue to say that if you do your strength work, then you're less likely to have Dons. And oh, but you've got crippling Dons. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the question is maybe you won't get to the start line of the Olympics in four years exactly. or in eight years if you're not doing the strength training. Yeah, that's true. Okay, next one. Would you rather? Do a marathon or high rocks? A marathon. Really? Yeah, not I'm just not. Yeah, I'm just not. It's not for me right now. Like, I just, it's it's cool. It's fun. I thought with the running and the lifting, you might yeah. be tempted. I like both. I like them both, like, separately. I don't want to, like, mix it together. Yeah. It's like certain foods, you know, they could taste good on themselves, but you probably want to want to have it together. <laughs> <laughs> and have you done a marathon? Uh, not yet, no. Um, people have asked me is like oh you haven't done a marathon yet and for me it's like the underlying why is going to be like really big i know i want to do it at some stage to to understand what it feels like what my clients go through to challenge myself to know that i can conquer the distance but i don't think that that reason has been sort of like sort of burning deep enough within me at the moment to want to do it that and also life things have got married this year and I can imagine telling my wife in the lead up or the, the day of the wedding, it's like, oh, by the way, can you give me two hours to do my long run and in the lead up to a marathon? So there's been a few things around life in the last probably 24 months that truly limits to that. But I think all in all, I think it, it, if it was a big enough wide, I probably would have still done it. So it's probably goes down to that just not being as important for me at the moment. Amazing. Okay, last one. Would you rather tape up the world's worst feats or do a PT session when all you can smell is someone else's protein farts. 
Yeah, I'll type up feet. I do that every day, anyways. That's an easy one. Yeah. The world's worst feet, though. The world, yeah, yeah. I've, and I, I don't feet. know. <laughs> I mean, her feet are pretty manky, but I've seen worse. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, we're, I, I've, I've seen some pretty dodgy feet, so yeah. I, I, I'll and you only got to deal with that for like temporary thing. I, yeah. I think when you work in like sort of health and medicine, like you get used to the odors and the smells and all the weirdness and you know the black toes. So yeah, I'm sort of very numb to that all of that. Mm. I'm not saying Johnny Davies also has the worst feet in the world, but all I remember is you taping up his feet on his challenge, like yeah, all day, every day. <laughs> I would say after twelve, after after twelve days or eleven days, rather, sorry, um, yeah, he probably didn't have the best feet in the world. <laughs> but I've I've worked with some ultra runners back in Australia when they were doing like some crazy challenges across the country, and yeah, they would have some beautiful like black gangrene gangrenously looking toes, and yeah, they're not fun. Amazing. Um, well, let us tell you our uh, embarrassing story of the week. So invite our runners to send us in their embarrassing stories to podcast.runner.com or send us a voice note uh, to us on Instagram. Um, and while we're reading ours out, uh, you'll have to think of your most embarrassing story that you've had yourself or maybe an embarrassing story that you, uh, you've had come into clinic. Um, do you want to share today's uh, story, Anya? Yes, yes. Okay, so I joined a running club to make friends. I wanted to make a good first impression as I had just moved to London. Shortly after starting, I really needed a poop. So I squatted behind a building in the park. I pulled up my shorts and got a few funny comments from the other runners who knew exactly what I was doing. Then one person laughed, finding it hilarious that I decided to go behind the toilet rather than going in the building and using the actual loo. The building I squatted behind was a public bathroom. I could never go back to that run club again. (laughs) <laughs> so they've joined they've joined a run club desperate for the loo and pooed on the floor behind the toilets and they just wanted to make a good first impression yeah, it's poo brain the when you when you when you need to go the common sense and rationality leaves the window right but also yeah. the closer you get to the toilet the more you need it's so did so they true. have it in 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 play there that they really needed the toilet so they desperately needed to go but they didn't quite work out that that was the toilet it's so true yeah, yeah. I feel like it, it's always a poo story. Like the first thing when you asked me that question, I was just like, "Yeah." Like I constantly have runners coming in, like you know, having having to find a toilet, whether it's a marathon or a long run or something like. Or like central London sometimes can sometimes be a little bit tricky yeah. trying to find a toilet. So yeah, I think yeah, a good poo story is always quite embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. my app idea is where we can in- you've told me this well, this is a good it, idea we can put it on the runner app um an app that you have to pay a subscription to and you have all the toilets on a map of london and you can click on each one to see which is near you and it has like the code for the door because in my notes on my phone i keep like costa st james and i have the code <laughs> for the door so i don't have to necessarily buy a coffee but i can use that that'd be worth a lot there. of money yeah yeah i could see people paying for that and for you sure free book yeah. so you, could, you could like know which ones are available because imagine you get to Costa and there's a queue so of three good. people. Yeah. You should be able to see which ones are open. Yeah. And then you divert your run to the nearest coffee shop where there's a toilet. And then you book it out. Yeah. So that way no one can even take it and it's reserved for you. Yeah. And your app should tell you the waiting list on that as well. Like, you know, okay, cool. I'm not going to Costa's and St. James. So there's 12 people lined up for this one. <laughs> yeah, well, I think well, then you need to be able to integrate this into your route. You know that about 3 yeah, or 4k yeah. and you always need to need to visit the toilet. And uh, you, you factor that into your, your route plan as well. I think the million dollar question is like, what do you call an app like that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, go, I'll get back to you on that one. We probably shouldn't publish this episode now so we can get the developers yeah, downstairs yeah. working on uh, integrating this into Runner, right? Run down straight um, Anyway, well, uh, yeah, no, that's uh, that's our uh, silly silly um, story of the week. Um, but the thing that we like to leave each of our episodes with um, would be our final silly question. Sure. So envisage that you are on the start line of your first marathon. Sure. And you're completely naked. Okay. And you can bring three things. What are you bringing for your first marathon? Completely naked and bring three things. I need my gels. Okay. It's like, where do I put them? That's that's my next thought. So, yeah, I'll bring my gel. I'll bring my phone. Your phone? (laughs) Yeah, I'll bring my phone. Just in case I need clothes, I call somewhere. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I'll bring my gels, my phone, and... Yeah, maybe my headphones. And figure so it... your your new wife. Wait, is, do, wait, is... do I? Uh, are shoes part of the the na- or No, no. So you can choose clothes, shoes. I can got you. So, so at the moment, do you want to sub out your gels, your phone? I thought I had shoes on. No, no, so you're, you're naked. Okay, cool. you can I'll bring take. Things. I'll take shoes. Okay, so what shoes? Are you bringing your carbon shoes or? I mean, I'm not that fast. Okay, I'll, so I'll, I'll take these clad monsters. Okay, I have so you've on. got your on shoes on. Um, I've got my on shoes. I've got my gels. Yeah. 
and now that I can pick clothes, then I just pick a pair of shorts and that, yeah. Okay, you're not putting it on Strava? Hey? You're not putting it on Strava? No, not as important, no. no. As shorts? Dignity is more important than Strava. (laughs) Sounds like a pretty sensible option. Yeah, I'd I'd like to think so, yeah. We haven't had anyone (laughs) say bring a phone so that someone can bring them clothes mid-marathon. Hmm. Because also that does kind of feel like cheating because you could yeah. ring someone and be like, can you bring me like 10 more items? Yeah. yeah. So I think you're not allowed to receive items. Yeah. But I feel like I'm always like when you and when someone goes, oh, can you, uh, if you had three wishes from a genie, what'd you pick? And I'm always like, well, I'll pick my first one to be three extra wishes. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm always that person. <laughs> hey, that is amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast Mate, and sharing you. your amazing wisdom to help our runners. Um, and I guess if anyone wants to get in touch and fire over any questions or come and see you in the clinic, where can they find you? Yeah, for sure. So on Instagram, it's um, at it's my physio Adrian. Um, I'm guessing my handles be in the show notes. Um, and then in terms of coming into clinics, so I'm the the founder of the Running Room in the UK. So we have two clinics across uh, London. We have one in London Fields, it's East London, and we have one in Vauxhall, which is Southwest London. So just www the running room.net and come in and see myself one of the team and anyone in the team is going to be amazing to help out and we're going to be working with adrian to bring some amazing uh physio specific yes. resources to all of our runners in the runner app as well for sure it's thanks. gonna be fun thanks for having us mate thanks for having me well hang on i didn't have, yeah i said that wrong thanks for coming in <laughs> <laughs> thanks for having me <laughs> thanks for having us <laughs> today's podcast is brought to you by runner If you want to train for any running goal, please download the app and don't forget you can use the code RUNNERPODCAST for a two-week free trial. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, share, follow, do all of that nonsense and we'll be back here next week. And if you want to be featured, uh, send us your embarrassing running story. Either send us a voice note on Instagram or send us an email to podcast at runner.com so that we can have a good laugh at your expense in Runner HQ and share it on one of the next episodes.